My name's uh, Christian Brower. I'm a children's pastor here at New Hope Church. That's enough out of you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but we'll talk later. Thank you. <laughs> Most Sundays I get to be at the other end of the building, uh, but today I get to be here with you guys, say, just a few times a year. In fact, at uh, the other end of the building in what we call Kid Zone. Uh, right now we're going through a series. It's the first time we've ever done this called Bad Boys of the Bible. And we're looking at his stop wooing. It's not a good, these are bad men, all right? Bad people that were the evil kings. And yet every time there's a story with an evil king that despised God and hated him, there's someone who is faithful in the same story. So we looked at a few weeks ago, we looked at Ahaz, this evil king. And the other side, there was Isaiah that was faithful to God in the middle of it. Then the Assyrian king Sennacherib was there and mocked God. And Hezekiah says, no, God will not be mocked. We'll be faithful to him. This week, we talk about Nebuchadnezzar. Right now, they're learning about Nebuchadnezzar, how in his pride, he pounds his chest and says, look at this giant thing I'm going to erect for myself. You will bow down and worship it because I am worthy of it. I am powerful in his pride. And these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we will not bow down to you even if we have to die. Our, our God is able to save us even if he doesn't save us. We'll still not serve you. We'll serve our God. They did that not out of pride, but of humility for the true and the risen Savior. We don't approach God with, with pride, but rather with humility. We love that. We love what they're learning down there today. Thank you for allowing us to teach and be with your children uh, every, every Wednesday. We love what's at, what the Lord is doing in their lives. Today, we're in Luke chapter 19 here. Uh, this is uh, near the end of the book. So Luke is a gospel of the New Testament, the gospel according to Luke. It means it's the story of Jesus, his birth, his life, the miracles he performed, the parables that he did. It's a, uh, it's a collection of them leading up to his death and then his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. This is the story of the redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're in chapter 19. There's 24 chapters in the book, which means we're nearing the end. The pinnacle of what's happening, you know it's coming. The cross is coming. It's coming next week, in fact, in the life of Jesus here. Not next week in, the, in, in our chapter here, but in the life of Jesus, it's happening next week. And so as we look at chapter 19, we dare not look at it on its own, but rather we first look to chapter 18, which you guys have been studying the last two weeks to inform us what's happening in 19 and beyond. We always want to look at uh, Scripture within the context of what's going on around us so we can answer the question, who is Jesus, where is he going, and who is he talking to? So we want to remember four things from chapter 18 that will help us today from the last two weeks. Number one, there's the parable of the tax collector and, and the Pharisee. The Pharisee comes before God and he says, Lord, I've done everything I should to be justified before God. Look at me, he pounds his chest and he says, I've done everything right. And then the tax collector, who's represented as the sinner, the tax collector's there, and he says, God, I, I won't even, uh, I'm not even near you. I won't approach you, but from far away, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, the one that repented, the tax collector, the sinner, he's the one that's justified before God. It's a parable, he says, just in, in the last uh, chapter. Then as Jesus is walking, he's hurrying towards somewhere. Do you guys know where he's going? Jerusalem. He's headed towards Passover to the cross. And as he's walking, he says, there's parents that are coming with their children. Here, touch my child that they may be blessed. And the disciples say, get out of here. Don't touch him. Don't bother our rabbi. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Let the children come to me because this is the only way that you may enter the kingdom of heaven is like a child. So first we've got the parable of the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee. Then you've got the little children coming to him as we inherit the kingdom of God like a child. And then he tells a story of the rich young ruler, this man who has everything. He says, Lord, what must I do to attain eternal life? And he says, you've, got, you've done all these things. Yes, but there's one more thing you have to do. Sell everything you own and come and follow me. And he turns away sadly because he can't let go of it. He loves his comfort and his style and what he has in his life. He can't let go of it. And Jesus says, for this man to enter the kingdom of God is impossible with man. But with God, all things are possible. We remember this story last week. And then, of course, we see the story of the blind man, Bartimaeus. He's on the side of the road, and he, Jesus passes by, and he says, who is this? I need to see him. And then finally, he comes face to face with Jesus, and he says, what do you want from me? He says, Lord, have mercy on me. I want to see 
We have the parable of the tax collector. Then we have the little children coming to God, coming to Jesus. And then we have the rich young ruler. And then at the end, we have Bartimaeus. Lord, let me see you. Remember those four things. We, we, he, he knows that you've seen and you've read these things when we come to chapter 19. A story, by the way, that you all know. In fact, this is such a mainstream story that people do not, do not call themselves Christians or believers probably know this story. You've heard it as a little kid many times. And what's fascinating about what we're going to read today is, one, it's a picture of salvation for those who would not believe. So if this is like your first time here, or you think, I don't really know what you're talking about. I don't know what salvation is. I don't know who Jesus is. Today's a great day for you to be here, because we're going to talk about what it looks like to actually follow Jesus, to commit with your heart and repent that Jesus might save your soul in eternity. We're going to talk about that. But if you are also here and you say, I've, I've been a Christian all my life. I've been following Jesus all the time. This is a great reminder today of what it was before we saw Jesus and how we might act as Jesus passes by. So here we are in chapter 19. Listen to this. He, meaning, this is Luke chapter 19, verse 1. He, meaning Jesus, enters Jericho and was passing through. That's important. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. That's all we need to start right now. We're setting the stage for the story today. You guys know the story of Zacchaeus. But look at the language there. In chapter 18, we saw some of the language that Jesus is talking about, how he's passing through, how he's walking by, how he's moving towards Jerusalem. He's moving towards the cross, his final goal. In fact, you remember in chapter 9, Pastor Craig talked about Jesus moving towards the cross with a resolute heart. He was focused on it. This is where he's going. He's only passing through Jericho. He's moving on the way to somewhere else. This is important to know. This is why context matters. And he comes upon a man who he doesn't see yet. His name is Zacchaeus. We know Zacchaeus is there, but right now we only know a little bit about him. We know that he's a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. And we know that he's rich from this, very likely illegitimately so. What do we know about tax collectors in the Bible? They're synonymous with sinners. Every time there's someone that is not righteous, but a sinner against God, that he is looked at and he's compared to a tax collector. In fact, a tax collector in Jewish law is not even able to testify in court. Do you know why? Because their testimony in their word is viewed as suspect, simply because of the nature of what they do. These people didn't work for Israel. They worked for Rome. They were, they were traitors to their own people. They worked for Rome. And you know how they collected their salary? It wasn't a set salary that was brought for them. Whatever they collected from the people, they took a chunk of that. That's how they got their money. You can see how this guy probably had a lot of power because he could go and say, this is how much tax you owe. And they would say, I can't pay it. All right, go to jail. As soon as you can pay it, then you can come out of jail. He had immense power, not a lot of social standing. People did not like him. He was rich and illegitimately so. And he was a tax collector, meaning that uh, he took from all these people and he just decided what, what the Rome needed and he would collect a portion from himself and he would send the rest to Caesar and he would go live his life in great comfort. But he wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector, which meant he had tax collectors under him, a giant Ponzi pyramid scheme of corruption. And at the top is this man, Zacchaeus. This is the man in the story today. And we find out in verse 3, right after this, we find out something else about him. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, for he, meaning Jesus, was about to pass that way. So now all of a sudden we see the story. It's kind of coming into view. Zacchaeus is there. This is his town. He knows the streets. He knows the people there. But there's a murmur. There's something happening here. Something new, something different. And as Jesus gets closer, there's people following him. His disciples are with him. People are being healed. There's something, there's an excitement. What's going on? He has to go near there. So he goes there and he's short. So he's jumping up. He's pulling at people. What is it? What's there? Let me see. And finally, here's the name. This is the rabbi, Jesus. This is the one that could be the Messiah. So what does Zacchaeus do? He looks to where they're going. He runs ahead of them. He climbs up into a sycamore tree, a big tree, a sturdy tree, an easy to climb tree, and climbs up there and waits for them to pass by just to get a glimpse of this one that they call the Messiah. 
Do you remember all those things we talked about in 18? The parable of the tax collector, the little children that, that, that came up to him, the rich man that couldn't enter heaven with God, these things are impossible, or with man, these are impossible, with God, all things are possible. And then the, the, the blind man said, let me see. These parables and these short stories come all together in this one, where all of a sudden, here we have Zacchaeus, a real life tax collector, this is not a parable anymore, who's rich and illegitimately so. He sees Jesus, and so he, sees, he hears of Jesus, and says, I must go. And he climbs a tree like a child to get up there high and say, God, I must see you. Jesus is showing us, here's the real life example of everything I've been talking about. This is how we're gonna handle all these parables come together in fruition right in Zacchaeus here. Here it comes. So Zacchaeus climbs this tree, and I wonder, this is his town, this is where he was. I, this, the Bible doesn't say this. I wonder if this is a tree that he's climbed many times, climbed up there and hidden and looked for trade deals and looked for money changing hands and found out where all the money was that he could tax everyone that was coming through, and he was kind of surveying the town, right, and knew what was happening from his little perch, and nobody could see him up there. I don't know, but he probably knew this tree because he runs for it, and he climbs up into the tree, and he's hoping to see Jesus from above. And what happens? Jesus passes by, and here's what it says. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said at him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. There's three really important things that happen here. Number one, there's a miracle here that we don't want to miss, and that's that Jesus knew Zacchaeus' name. He didn't know him. They weren't friends. There's no reason that he would have known him, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, Zacchaeus come down. He knows his name. He probably knows more than his name, but he knows his business dealings. He knows all his downfalls and his pride. He knows his hurts and his aches. He knows everything about him. And yet he still calls out to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I must be with you today. I hope that we can pause there for a second and look at that miracle as something that happens in our lives too. That as we pray before God, we don't say, Lord, it's me, Christian Brower of, uh, you don't know me, but I really need something from you, you great and powerful being. He says, no, I, I know you. I know you, and, and that's a miracle that Jesus knows your name. And when you go before him in prayer or in praise or in adoration or in worship, he knows you and he receives that from you. And when you pray to him, you say, God, I've got this huge thing that I want in my life this thing that needs to change, health or, or uh, with something with your children or with your job or, or with a relationship, whatever it is, God, I've got this big thing that needs to be changed, but he won't do it. This miracle that won't, won't happen. Don't miss the first miracle there, that Jesus knows your name individually as a person. That's a huge deal. Don't miss it. But after that, we have two things that happen. First of all, an invitation from Jesus. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, Come down now. I must stay with you. Jesus is excited to spend time with this man. And why? He knows him. He knows that he's a chief sinner. He's the chief of tax collectors. He's got all this money illegitimately. If he truly is headed towards, resolutely towards his goal of Jerusalem and the cross and his death and his resurrection, why would he waste his time on this guy up in a tree? I don't understand it. If you're coming into town, wouldn't you go and say, all right, well, as we're passing through, who do I need to glad hand here? What are the, 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 the famous people or the, the righteous people or the people that everybody loves here? How do I get in, in with this town and with this crew that I might find the right people to connect with? But no, he goes to the, the social outcast and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. He says, I must come to your house today. But God is not a God that's going to go and break into his home. He's not gonna stand there and quarter at his front door and say, you must let me in. But rather, what does Jesus wait for? His reception, that he would be received. And Zacchaeus receives him very gladly, it says. He receives him and welcomes him into his home. We see something really interesting here. This is the story of what the gospel is. 
And let me explain to you what, let me explain what, I, what I mean by that as we, as we get into the next part here. Verse 7, now, now they go and they're, uh, they're leaving. He comes down the tree, Zacchaeus, I need to come to your house. Yes, Lord, I will receive you. Please come in. And they go to his house. And verse 7 says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's going to the house of a sinner. Why would he do this? Why would he do this? And Jesus does this a lot, right? He kind of bucks social norms and changes things and says, this is not who you should be spending time with, especially Jesus. Do you know how short your time is? He's the only one that knows. Everyone else, the disciples are really excited to go to Jerusalem. You know why? They think the kingdom of God is now, is immediate. He's gonna come with a strong fist and he's gonna put his foot down and he's gonna reign with power and with might and with glory. And when we get there and when Passover happens, we're gonna overrun the government and this is gonna be our time. The kingdom of God is immediate and at hand. That's what they think is coming. Why are we wasting time with this guy? Let's get out of his house and go to where we're supposed to go. You're, we're hanging out with this guy, the sinner? Why? When they get to the house, it doesn't say that Jesus said anything. He, he may have. Jesus may have, may have said something. They may have talked first. I don't know. But the next thing we know is that Zacchaeus begins to talk. So it may be that he, they ate together. It may be that Jesus said something first. It may have just been that Jesus was giving them the look, you know, like the fatherly look, like you know what you did, right? Probably not. But at the very least, the presence of Jesus is there. That's all we know for sure is that Jesus is physically present there. And how does he respond? Zacchaeus says this. He stood up and said, Lord, Lord, here and now I give you, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Whatever Jesus has done just by being in his life has altered and changed him in a very dramatic fashion. Half of what I have, I'm going to give to the poor. A pious Jewish person uh, under Old Testament law, the very best people would give 20% to like good things to give to the poor. Not your tithe, but 20% to give to, to things in your community that you thought were important. 20%, he says, but I'm not going to do that. And he doesn't say, when I die, Lord, I'm going to give half to the poor. But here and now, right now, I give half, not 20%, but half of all I, all I own to the poor. And not only that, but whoever I cheated, whoever I cheated out of anything, I'm not going to give them just back their money, but four times what I stole from them, which under Torah law probably would have been about two times he should have paid back what it should have been if, if he had been found guilty in a court of law. It would have been given two times back. Do you know what kind of crimes you had, you had to commit in order to have to pay four times back what you owed? Much more heinous crimes than thievery. This is the worst of the worst punishment would be paying back four times what you had stolen from somebody, what you had taken from somebody. So here Zacchaeus says, says half, not 20%, but half of what I own, I give to the poor now. And four times of anything that I stole from anyone, I will return right now. Do you know what this is? It's repentance. It's turning away from the life that he thought, this is what I want. And all of a sudden, here's Jesus in front of him and everything in his world changes. Lord, I don't need any of that. I want to be righteous before you. I want to be right. You remember we talked about the, the, the uh, rich man? Impossible for him to inherit the kingdom of God by man's standards, but with God, all things are possible, he says. Now here is a rich man that came so illegitimately so, and here he is before Jesus, and he says, Half of everything I own is gone. 20%, sorry, 20, four times the amount of, of, uh, of what I stole, I will give back. Jesus changes his heart radically in a moment of repentance. And here's what Jesus says back to him. Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, hallelujah, <laughs> Jesus recognizes that with this repentance, salvation has come with this. And he says, Jesus didn't come just to save the people that are already had it all together, but came to seek and to save the lost. This whole story so far is like a picture of what the gospel is, of what it's like to receive salvation from our Lord. Zacchaeus 
is in town. He hears the murmur. Something's going on. Something's changed. What is it? What is it? What is it? The crowd gets louder. It gets louder. What, what is happening here? He pulls. Tell me what the problem is. Tell me who is here. What's changed? It's Jesus. And he says, I need to know. And something has changed. I need to see him. I need to go. I will become like a little child, in fact. If that's what it means to go see him, I will climb this tree and look over. And when he gives that invitation to come to be with me face to face, I will gladly say, yes, here I am, Lord. And when I'm with him, and, and it's time to change my life, I will repent of the way that I've lived, that I might live for you. This is, uh, this is Zacchaeus' story. It's also our story, where we would be sometime in our life, we think something doesn't feel right. Something has changed, or something's stirring in my heart. What is it? And finally, you hear the name Jesus. This is what you're missing. This is what's happening in your heart. It's Jesus. You say, I will do anything to find out more about this. Who is this man? this son of God, the most high king, who is it? And I'll do anything. I'll become like a child and I'll go. And when you get before Jesus and he calls you by name and says, come down, he gives you an opportunity, an invitation for salvation, but he gives the invitation to all those that are, those that receive it are the ones that receive salvation. The invitation is given to all, but Zacchaeus gladly receives it. And when he comes and sits down on the face to face, what does he do? Repent. That's what we do as well. This is the story of the gospel. If you have grandchildren, like what, is it, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? You have coworkers that have a struggle that question, like how do I start? What do we talk about? What does it mean to be saved? This is the story. You can feel it throughout this whole thing. Slight heart change by work of the Holy Spirit. And then the name of Jesus. And then him pursuing Jesus, climbing any way he can do it. And then Jesus comes and says, you I want to talk to you immediately. I must come with you. And he gladly receives it. And then he takes his repentance. And he says, Lord, I will do anything to follow you. This is the story of the gospel. This is each of us today. That would be really nice if that was like the end of his interaction here, but it's, it's not. He says, I, I have a parable to tell you. And there's a reason he tells this parable. He says, my disciples, I can see it in their demeanor. I can feel it. I, I know what's happening in them. They think something's about to happen. That's not. And here's what it is. Verse 11. While they were listening to this, this is Zacchaeus repenting. And Jesus says, this man is a son of Abraham, or a, a, a son of Abraham, which, which means that he also is due the promise of Abraham, which is to say he's a child of God now. This is a man that's a child of God. That's what he means. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because this is verse 11 in Luke chapter 19. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return when he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this to work, he said, until I come back. So Jesus is now with his disciples and Zacchaeus is there and he can feel something going on. They think that we're in a hurry here. We have some urgency because we've got to get to Jerusalem. And he's told them many times, he's uh, predicting his death. And scripture tells us at least twice that they were kept from knowing it, from understanding it. They didn't hear him, that he was going to die. And that's how the kingdom was going to come. They thought, here comes our earthly king strong in power and mighty to save us from the Roman Empire or the Assyrians or anyone who would come against us. Here is the messianic era now. And Jesus says, I've been trying to tell you. And here's another parable while I tell you again. The kingdom is now where Christ reigns in our heart, but it's not fulfilled yet. I'm gonna go away first and then come back. So he says, well, I'm away I, I'm going to give something to my servants, this mine. It's, people say it might be a roughly $10,000, three months wage. Some people say it's far less than that. It doesn't matter for this. But I'm going to each give you the same amount, this mine. I'm going to give 10 of my servants this. And when I'm away and when I come back, I want you to put it to work while I'm away. But as he leaves, there's a delegation of people, his enemies. These are not his servants. His enemies send someone to say, hold on. We don't want this man to be our king. Hey, this is not our king. We don't want him. But he says he is the king. He's due his kingship. He will be king. So when the, when the king comes back, the nobleman became king and then comes back. And he goes to a servant and says, what did you do? I, gave, I, I made you traitors in my name. Small time 
traders within your towns. I gave you a little bit. What did you do with it? The first servant says, here, I took this mina and I made it into 10. And he says, well done. I give you 10 cities to look over, to rule over. That's a huge improvement from $10,000 to 10 cities. That's a big responsibility he's giving this person. The next person says, what did you do while I was away? Here's, I, 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 you, I, I started with one. Here's five minus. He says, I give you five cities. But then it comes to the third. It comes to the third servant. And there's 10 servants here. We only hear about three of them. He comes to the third servant. He says, what did you do? He says, oh, I thought you to be a harsh man, an austere man, someone that wouldn't be trifled with. I was afraid, essentially, is what he's saying, to lose what, what you gave me. Because what if I tried to trade and spend it, and then I lost it, and it was gone, or I came back with less? I was afraid of what you would do to me. So instead, what I did was I wrapped it up in a handkerchief, and I hid it, and I did nothing with it. And the king is angry at this. Why would you do that, he says. I'm going to judge you by your own words. Well, why did you not at least put it in the bank and give me interest for it? He says, I'm going to take away yours and give it to him that was 10. Well, hold on. That's not fair. That guy's already got a bunch. This is all I have. He says, no, no, it's going to be worse because you know those enemies of mine, the ones that sent a delegation away to say we don't want him to be king, well, now they're going to be brought before me and they're going to be killed. And that's the end of our passage today. His enemies are slaughtered before him. We're like, goodness, what are, we, what are we supposed to do with this, Lord? He's showing us the gravity of where he's going. The anticipation of going to, to Jerusalem is not just that Passover's coming and that he's celebrating this feast, but rather he knows he's going to his death, and not just his death, but his crucifixion. And that accomplishment on the cross will mean life and death eternal for everyone. This is what he's getting at. It's a very serious moment. What I'm about to accomplish has consequences for every person. He doesn't want them to miss it. So the question is this. Okay, I understand that the, the noble man that becomes the king is Jesus. He's, he's here now. He's going to go away, and then he's going to return. And while he's away, he gives us this thing. And he says, work while I'm away, and when I return, we'll see what happens. So the question is, what is this thing supposed to be, this mina? What is it for us? Is it our salvation? Certainly not. The Bible tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's not stripped from us and given to someone else. That's ridiculous. However, I think the clue to what the mina is is what the disciples are thinking and talking about when Jesus tells this parable, which is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is wherever God reigns, here on, on, in heaven and on earth. That's what they're talking about. And I think the mina would be our gift in helping in the advancement of his kingdom while he's gone. He says, I give you all the same opportunity to advance my kingdom, to advance Christ's reign wherever you live. Some of us will go away and we'll have this one opportunity. We'll turn it into 10, a thousandfold return, Lord, for what you've given me. Look at what your, where your kingdom is now because of my faithfulness. He says, well done. And some of us will say, Lord, with what you gave me, I gave you five in return. Look at what I've given you uh, while you were away this work. But he says, there's some people that would say, oh man, I'm afraid. What if I fail? What if I can't get into it? What if uh, he gives me this gift of the advancement of his kingdom and I cannot do it and I lose it and I lose my, my uh, relationship with people because of it? I'm afraid. I'm just going to hide it in here and I'm not going to do anything with it. And when he returns, I'm still going to have it. He says, no. Because when I return, there's going to be life and death consequences. The servant, I believe, still keeps his servanthood. He's still a child of the Most High King. But it's a big warning for us, isn't it? That while he's away, we are to work towards his kingdom and not just towards our own. After, he, after reading this parable, it's imperative to then look back at Zacchaeus and even chapter 18 and recognize, my goodness, this is why he showed us this story. We're wondering this whole time, if, if he's heading resolutely towards the cross, why did he show us this story? Why did he stop? Why did he spend time with this sinner? He says he came to seek and to save the lost. He 
He's showing us this picture. This is what my kingdom is about. Not these Pharisees that think they all have it all put together, but, but are doing it in their own strength and in their own might, but someone like this, someone that has no standing before you, has done everything wrong. He's the chief of everything that you hate. But when he repents before me and accepts my offering, this is what I came to seek and to save as people like this. And my friends, that is you, and that is me. So as we look at both characters in this story, both Jesus and Zacchaeus, we learn something from both of them. Because Jesus comes in and he's got a goal in mind and it's not Jericho and it's not Zacchaeus, it's not there. It's the cross. Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem and going towards final goal. How easy would it have been to say, get out of my way, I don't wanna see it. I, I Just leave it down. We're gonna go to the triumphal entry. You're gonna lay down branches. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what's mine, which is the kingdom. And then I'm gonna die and that's what I'm gonna do and just get out of my way, people, because I gotta go save you. But... He doesn't do that, does he? He takes time with the one, with the individual. Friends, this is, this is our life. We've got a goal for this day and for this week and for this month and for this season of life and for our lives. We've got something we're looking towards ahead all the time. Lord, this is a good thing you've given me. This is what I'm headed towards. But today, this afternoon, and tomorrow when you go to work, there's going to be interruptions and there's going to be things in your path that it would be so easy to say, I've got this great thing in the future. Get out of my way. I've got to work towards it. But we see this example of Jesus. We say, he doesn't do that. He will stop and take time and say, I must be with you, Zacchaeus. So should we be the same with every person that comes into our, that God puts in our path, that we are not people that would push them aside for the greater thing, but we'd remember the individual that God placed in front of us, truly, that's who we came for, to seek and to save the lost. But we are also Zacchaeus in this story. For those of us who have never professed faith in Jesus and have never come to a, a moment of decision where we choose to follow him and repent, this is that you are Zacchaeus in this. I don't care how good you say, oh, I've done so many good things. I've, 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 I've done so many righteous deeds. The Lord says they're like filthy rags to him. <laughs> And he says, well, I, he, he couldn't possibly love me because I've done all these, I've done all these awful things. He says, yeah, that's true. With, with man, this would be impossible. But with God, all that stuff that you've been holding on to, you can let go of it and you can repent. It is possible for you to inherit the kingdom of God. We see that in Zacchaeus. What does your life look like when Jesus passes by? And when Jesus invites himself into your life and into your home, he's not going to keep knocking and at the door and be like, I'm out here, I'm out here, I'm out here. But rather, he says, Lord, I, I, or Zacchaeus, I must be with you. And Zacchaeus joyfully receives him. We must be the same. First in salvation, that we joyfully receive his gift of salvation. But even beyond that, anytime he's in our life, what does his presence do to us? When we're in his presence, Lord, and we are, by the way, always in the presence of God. When he's in our midst and in our presence, what are we like? How are we changed? Just the mere presence of Jesus changed Zacchaeus forever. He was a different man forever. What is it like for us when we're in the presence of Jesus? Are we that changed man and woman? As we end here, I want to connect two things. We had chapter 18, which all of those four things came together in Zacchaeus. He says, I'm going to show you what I'm doing here. And I'm showing you that I came to seek and save the lost and not just the people that you think deserve it. Do you know what happens next in this story? They're, they go into Jerusalem. It's the triumphant entry. All these people are coming and they say, here's our king. Here's our king. He's coming. We lay down the branches. He, we're going to crown him king right now. The kingdom of God is at hand and it's immediate. And our trials and tribulations are over because he's here. The messianic era is upon us now. All those people came and they worship God on the side of the streets from afar. And when it turned out not to be the earthly kingdom that they thought, many of them turned away and turned against him. But Zacchaeus saw Jesus up close, face to face, in his home and in his presence, and it changed him forever. 
We don't want to be a people that simply just worships God from afar and says, Lord, Lord, you're so good on Sunday, but the rest of the week I'm kind of my own person. But rather, we look at him face to face and he says, Dan, I must be in your house. And we willingly accept his offer and accept repentance from this. We may think, we look at chapter 18 and we may think that we are beyond him because of either we're a child or because we're a Pharisee or because we're a tax collector and a sinner or because we're a rich person and we're holding on to something that's more valuable to us than God. All those things in, in chapter 18 and we think, or we're blind to him and we, don't, we can't see. And all those things come to fruition here altogether. When Jesus says, you are not beyond my grasp. You are not beyond my grace. I came to seek and save people like you. If you are, do not know him, this is an opportunity for you to say, Lord, I repent of the way I live and I want to follow you. If you do follow him, this is a huge reminder to say, God, what am I like when you're in my presence? And what kind of goal you put before me that I'm casting aside all these people in my path, Lord, let me to be like you, that I would care about the individual and the sinner and the tax collector in my life. I pray that we can do that this week. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for this story. God, we know this story so well. We heard it as kids. We sing songs about it. But God, I pray that we'd see something new in it today because you are that kind of God that reveals such great and wonderful things about who you are all the time. Something new from an infinite God today, Lord. So we pray that your spirit would work in the hearts and minds of your people today, that we would know you, Lord, that we would recognize that we are like Zacchaeus in so many ways, that we are away from you. God, we do not deserve your grace or your mercy or your presence, and yet you say, I must be with you. And so, Lord, we receive your invitation for you to be in our hearts and in our house, that we might repent and be like you, Lord. You have everything that we need. We lack nothing when we are in you. We thank you for the story today, Lord. While you're away, we pray that, uh, that we would be at work, that the advance of your kingdom is, is within us, Lord, that we would allow ourselves to, to work for you and not be afraid of failing, but rather, Lord, give you all that we have that you might be pleased with us, Lord. We love you and we thank you for your word today. In your name we pray, amen.